Welcome to another AUG blog audio post located at AUGforums.com. That's AUGFORUMS.com. You can find the specific audio post at AUGforums.com slash audio post 17. That's audio post and the number 17. This is your host, Tim Rodman, coming to you live on Thursday, June 4th, 2020 from Columbus, Ohio. And in this audio post, we've got a conversation about enterprise software communities with John Reed. And John, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, thanks, Tim. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I've been a follower of an Acumatica community for a long time now, so a number of years at Acumatica shows. I'm the co-founder of Diginomica. We've been around for about seven years. And our, our focus at Diginomica is on, I guess you could say, the art and practice of transformation in enterprise space. Um, so it's not just technology, it's people and culture and business process and trying to understand what distinguishes successful projects from products that struggle and, and all the different elements that, that come into play there. And obviously uh, community is one of the areas that factors in and it's something that I love to revisit and write about when I can. Seven years, wow. You, you were one of the co-founders, right? And basically, yep. the way I look at it, you just travel around the world and write about stuff. So that's my view of it. <laughs> is, that, is that all you do? <laughs> yeah, you know, in, in a nutshell, I mean, uh, that that's kind of the bottom line. I mean, obviously, right now, we're not doing a lot of traveling, and there's a lot of stuff we can do virtually to accomplish similar goals. Uh, but but in general, we, we wanted to really write about the enterprise, but the enterprise, but in a different type of way that was much more focused on being practical uh, and looking at real use cases and not being so technology obsessed and giving people a really good reader experience. And, you know, we try to bring a little personality and humor into what we do, and that's certainly true, and especially in the weekly column that I do on hits and misses. But, but in general, we want to bring a little bit of flair and personality, but the most important thing is just relationships. And to your point, like, traveling really brings those relationships into focus. When you're not traveling, it's a little more challenging, but, you know, it could still be done. That's why we're on the phone together tonight, so. Love it. Yeah, I always enjoy reading the articles there. I feel like they're well done, they're in-depth, and it's not just marketing polish like you get on a lot of sites. And so I like the content you guys put out, and you can tell that a lot goes into it. You're not just writing off the top of your head. It's well-researched, and I'm sure it takes a good number of hours to put together hours to put together each one of those posts and uh, what makes them real fun to read. So I like what you guys do there. Thanks. Yeah, it's uh, you know there's there's a passion that goes into that. That's kind of like, <laughs> in a way, it's something. If you're infected with it, you kind of have to live with it and just you know try to, you know, put that into into the work and and take some pride in it. But it can be you know a challenge sometimes to hold yourself to that standard. I mean, a lot of the people that write on my site, I think, do such amazing work that I'm always kind of humbled and trying to trying to keep up. But you know, to me the the really rewarding thing is to let the reader into your process and to kind of, you know, tell them, okay, here's the questions I'm struggling with and here's here's what I found out. And, you know, that's an ongoing conversation. And so we want to we wanna be a part of those conversations. We know that we can't solve all the riddles of the enterprise ourselves. And I think that's one thing we really try not to do is hold ourselves as experts above other people. It's about facilitating and being a part of the other people. It's about facilitating and being a part of the conversation and hopefully, you know, the best projects and the best, uh, you know, communities, it's it's a range of people and a diverse viewpoints, and you need all those viewpoints in order to make it work. Yeah, I think that diversity of thought is a key element that you have that's, that's hard to get and that you do it full time and that you see so many different software products, not just Acumatica. I think that's why I was just thrilled when you were willing to come on and do an audio post talking about community because I think you have a, a very interesting perspective just seeing so many different products and I thought maybe we could start maybe with your take on enterprise software communities of the past and then move into where things are at in the present and maybe even I know you're you're pretty big on futuristic stuff you know where you think things in the future 
from an enterprise software community standpoint. So what's your what's your history lesson, first of all, on from your vantage point? Well, you know, I think I think enterprise communities, a lot of them have their origin in developer communities. And developers really pave the way uh, for for how communities emerge. I mean, you've seen that some even even in Acumatica with the success of your hackathons, for example. But developers kind of always had a natural need and culture and desire to to be a part of a group. And one thing, as you saw enterprise communities start to emerge, um, you also saw the you know that was probably like the first ones I saw of note were probably around the year 2000, but they might have started a little before then, but you started seeing the formation of user groups which have existed for a long time. I mean, I, I have actually even done a study of when the first, but one would think it started happening in the 70s. Uh, not all user groups are successful communities, but I think the one, the one interesting thing, if I had to pick one thing about the past, is that the community was really based on your website. I mean, there was a, there was a very geeky time in the history of online communities where, you know, it was the social network sites weren't dominant yet. You know, we didn't spend all our time on Facebook and LinkedIn and such. And pe you would have a destination site or two that you would bookmark, and that could include the web communities that you are a part of. And there are some vendors that had some very successful communities back, back in those days. Community has gotten more dispersed now. You know, when you talk about building a community now, you can't just – you can't just build it on your website and say, oh, everyone's going to come here all the time. And, and hopefully you still have a, you know, uh, a good, still have a, you know, uh, a good website community and people enjoy it. But, you know, that those conversations are going to spread onto different platforms, some of which you don't own and control. Uh, obviously there's a lot of discussions that happen on LinkedIn. There's a bunch of stuff that happens on Twitter, especially around events. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's a variety of in-person stuff, and some of the in-person stuff is moving virtual as well. Um, but, but that's the whole thing about the, the way community has shifted is now we have to start thinking about, like, it's, it used to be kind of if you build it, they will come. Now you have to build it, and then you have to really drive the recruitment. <laughs> you, you know, just because you built it doesn't mean anyone's going to show up anymore. And then it's kind of like, well, and then you have to go where the conversations are, which is a different way of thinking about it than it used to be. Yeah, it almost seems to me like your community. It almost seems to me like your community is is less about the destination and more about the relationships. Yeah, uh, almost. I don't know if it's down to the individual relationships, but it, you almost wonder anymore across anything, not just enterprise software communities. But you almost wonder if there really is this big cohesive thing anymore, or if it's just all about smaller niche and individual connections. And you know, even look at the way Netflix works; it's just so tailored to the individual, right? And, you know, I don't know what your what your thoughts are on on really bringing people together in a bigger way. Is it is it an event? Is that the only way you do it, or how do you have the broader community when you have all these little siphoned uh, things taking place across various different platforms. Well, I think I think large large community experience be resonant and interesting. Um, they can have a lot of energy to them. There are certain enterprise software shows that have a good energy. I mean, I've certainly noticed that at the the Acumatica Summit events, watching it grow every year, and just kind of getting blown away by the energy of it and. I think, you know, for example, you guys are a company not only in growth mode, but you tend to make software that customers really like, and so there tends to be a lot of energy around around your events. And I think it's hard to capture that type of energy in smaller group settings, in a sense. This kind of something that's contagious about that large, energetic audience. The, the challenge that we have in the kind of short to midterm here, however long it's going to be, six months, a year, uh, you know, whatever, is we're not going to have those events. Um, but, and, and those are going to be very hard to simulate online in terms of creating that. You might go to a large event, 
but your sense of community is often very sort of small and focused around things that you care about, right? Like so it's a little bit, community is a little bit like friendship in that sense that it's hard to maintain tons and tons of close friends. And eventually you kind of glom onto people with similar interests. And the, uh, the, you know, online can be very good for that in a sense because you can have these smaller groups crop up that share passion for certain things. You know, I've seen communities form around certain projects almost spontaneously and, you know, suddenly you're, you're on an email list, maybe you're on a Zoom call together and, you know, because the fact of the matter is you share certain interests and experiences and you can slice and dice that in any number of ways. But, you know, like, like right now in the midst of COVID and stuff, I think one interesting example is just how how different the experiences by industry, right? Example is just how how different the experiences by industry, right? So if you're if you're in the hotel and hospitality industry, you're having an interesting challenge right now. And even within retail, right, there's a whole different experience between fashion, which might be really struggling at the moment, versus, you know, something more like, you know, food service or distribution, which is doing pretty well. So you kind of want to talk with other people in your industry so that starts to subdivide things or you want to talk about people in your same role. And and so when you're building community, you're kind of thinking about facilitating those smaller group conversations as well, which kind of segue into the one-to-one -one pieces. But but I, I think the, the biggest accomplishment is getting those smaller groups of like-minded people interacting and talking, there's such huge value in that. And once you do that, then they, they tend to connecting one-on-one -on -one and LinkedIn and continuing those connections from there. And I agree that the big events, energy is a great word for them. You, you get uh, just stirred up and you feel good about the direction of the product when those big events are done well. Uh, I'm curious your take on, I always feel like though, at the same time, when I go to an Acumatica Summit, especially this last one in Las Vegas, I'm a total introvert, and I go to those things, and I just, I just feel exhausted. <laughs> and, yeah. And uh, like, if I were to design a software conference, my the ideal one for me personally, it'd probably be like cabins in a mountain uh, setting, <laughs> which you're never gonna see. But you know, I, I kind of wonder though, how many people also feel similarly, especially in something like back office, ERP, accountant heavy software like Acumatica. You know, I'm curious your energy style versus maybe a more low key, more opportunity for individually connecting at an event. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think if you're doing on the ground events, you're trying to give people a bunch of different ways to interact, to try to accommodate the different personality types you're describing. Um, I mean, you know, let's face it, if you're a huge, huge introvert and super shy, you're probably not going to go to an event at all because it's just too stressful. And there are people that fit that description. I mean, there's a whole industry around being an introvert in, in business. I know a couple of consultants who consult on this stuff full time. And, you know, it's an interesting type of challenge. Um, from an event design standpoint, you, you think about different ways to cultivate connections with people that make it feel more comfortable for people who don't have as easy a time. I, I do think that that we don't do as good a job comfortable for people who don't have as easy a time. I, I do think that that we don't do as good a job at at on the ground events with with kind of helping to kind of stir the pot a little bit and get people connected. I've been a part for about eight years now of an on the ground event. It's an ERP related event that I helped to start where it's a very small event, like no more than 150 people, but I, I designed some very unique networking things at that event that kind of, they kind of, it kind of it forces people to connect in small groups in a way that kind of takes some of that shyness off the hook because you don't have to get up the guts to walk up to someone at a reception or something because it's basically like kind of forcing you. And it's amazing how sometimes forcing people a little bit in a, in a kind way really helps. I don't think we've totally figured out how to do that online yet, um, but I think I think we do need to help people with that, and I think we need to help them find to help them 
find comfortable settings because the thing is like in the end I really really believe quite strongly that that on an individual level a, a better professional network is going to make a huge difference in the success of your career and also the projects that you're on so it is really important to build that network and so it does require developing the skills of how to how to do that even if like you said you're kind of shy and introverted you still need to figure out how to do it the good news is it can be very fun to build those relationships but there are definitely times I mean I you know I don't have a choice so I'll go to events and I've got to understand what's happening at these events because I'm writing about them so you know I'll, I'll go into lunch rooms and and sit down with people and I wasn't good at that in high school Tim I mean I, that was not my thing you know I, I stuck with my peeps <laughs> You know, and I, I couldn't have done that earlier in life, and and there's still that moment, and it it might, might sound weird because you're just sitting down with people, but and then of course not just sitting down, but then introducing yourself, and you know that kind of stuff is is not not easy for me, but but I I feel I have to do it, and I think some people they just they just kind of figure oh I'm not doing it, and then they kind of miss out on something big. You said a word there, fun, that uh, I want to link to an article you wrote, uh, boy, a few years ago now. You right. interviewed Mark Finnern, if that's how yeah, you pronounce yeah. his name. And there's one word that came out in there that I think he said, which was playfulness. And I think it's a right. similar kind of idea that you've got a difference between work and fun. And I think you're talking a little bit about introducing a fun element but then also that leads to connections. Would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, I think fun and humor and stuff like that are very, very disarmed years. He'll start with like a musical intro and sometimes he'll even have his guests do one too, you know, and, you know, someone will whip out their harmonica or something for a couple of minutes. And uh, I find that kind of stuff very disarming. And from that stems like, a different kind of opportunity to, to, to connect and, and form those relationships. And so, yeah, in that piece, I wrote about that a bit and talked about how fun and strategic value aren't, aren't in conflict the way we sometimes, sometimes think. And community without fun is, it's hard for me to, it, it starts to feel like just another kind of, it's, it's just a job in a way, or like if we get so obsessed with like measuring the results of community or how many people attended this webinar or whatever. I think a lot of those metrics are so deeply flawed and, and that notion of fun and playfulness really, people don't think about it, but it can be very powerful. Measuring the results of community or how many people attended this webinar or whatever. I think a lot of those metrics are so deeply flawed and, and that notion of fun and playfulness really, People don't think about it, but it can be very powerful. Yeah, it seems like to me the difference between sitting in a conference room versus sitting at happy hour. What what yeah. are the specific things that make those two different? I think to me one of them is you have to be there. One of them is you want to be there. And an element of fun is there. But um, I think a lot of it just has to be whether you chose to be there or not. And, and whether you feel like you're on the clock or not uh, when, right. you're, when you're together in that type of environment. So it seems like your take on communities of the past, if we were to look backward, would be more techie, more online focused, present uh, for a moment, just look to the future. Where, and I think COVID kind of puts an interesting spin on it, especially if you think that COVID type situations could could increasingly happen, or if it's just a once in a hundred year event. Uh, I guess maybe take COVID aside for a, for a moment. You just look to the future. Do you see enterprise events just um, becoming higher priority in terms of travel and the in person side of it? Do you see them being more regional, or do you see them just kind of being the the way they've always been? What, what's your take on? looking towards the future with enterprise software communities? So I think one of the, one of, I'm trying to think of the right, right phrase because there's nothing, I don't want to say there's good things happening right now in a sense because it would be, this is obviously an unprecedentedly difficult time for a lot of people, but, 
but from the standpoint, I suppose the silver lining is that we're we're going to be deprived of this is my opinion anyway. We're going to be deprived of in-person events for long enough that we're going to have to get a lot better at the virtual part and making the virtual part better. Because we know that a lot of online virtual events and opportunities to connect are really failures from the vantage point of real connection. It's mostly, I call them brain dumps, but it's informational stuff droning on in webinars for 45 minutes to an hour that may be asking a question or two. And that, that type of format doesn't foster community or relationships. And, it's, and I make the arguments in my articles that it's not a good business case to do those types of, of events anyhow. But the point is we're going to have to get a lot better at the virtual stuff. Um, and I think so, even some of the virtual event software is going to get better. So that's going to, that's going to happen. And then, and then eventually we are going to get more on the ground events again. And you know, the time frame of that we can talk about, especially in the sort of one to three year window. Um, we'll see a lot more of that. Um, and eventually we will have the large scale events. They'll still play a role. Um, but I, I do think that, that there's going to be more inter, interconnection between the larger events. And, you know, I think we'll see a lot of regional stuff before them. But we're going to find ways of combining face-to-face -face and virtual. But if I had to make a guess, I would say that the virtual is going to be more important in the future. And, and the face-to-face -face stuff will be important as well, but it just won't happen as often. It, it will happen. But I think we're going to see much more of a of a blend of the two that that works well for people, um, but some some of the speculation is a little bit difficult because, you know, like if you want to if you want to look out four years from now, for example, like we're going to have a vaccine in four years. I feel confident in that. Huge, as far as people's willingness to travel to things like events. Um, you know, large scale events. So, so we don't know the future of that exactly, but I do think we will eventually see a blend of, of, of the two with virtual playing a more important role kind of in between the, the face to face things that we go to. If I think of kicking off an implementation of Acumatica, it seems to me that most implementations nowadays are done primarily remotely, at least the blocking and tackling aspects of it. But at the same time, you have to have that in-person at least a couple days on site to kick things off. Otherwise, you don't really have a foundation to stand on, right? Right. And to your point, it may be that the, the most volume of interaction takes place, whether you call it online or, or virtually, Zoom, phone call, whatever. But your foundation place whether you call it online or, or virtually, Zoom, phone call, whatever, but your foundation, your relationship that makes it even happen has got to be face-to-face, -face, even if it's briefly, right? Yeah, I think so. And, and I think those kinds of things I think I'm, I'm more optimistic on coming back a little bit sooner because, you know, once you have, well, uh, this is a bit of a strong phrase, but once you have something along the lines of ubiquitous testing, then, you know, if if you and two colleagues are going to kick off a project, you know, you, you're testing before you leave, you know, you're, it looks like you're COVID-free, whatever, you head out, you know, you meet with, you meet with your client, you meet with the kickoff, um, everyone's practicing some form of, you know, relatively safe interactions, whatever that counts, and, and, and it works. Um, large scale events present a very different conundrum events present a very different conundrum because there's so many people from so many locations going to that event and yeah you're testing but now you're coming back and now you're invoking possibilities where you have to do contact tracing and you know it gets very complicated right whereas with with a smaller thing going to a client site the contact tra the contact tracing if anything needs to be traced you know, one would hope not, but if you have to, then it's fairly straightforward to figure out, oh, you were in contact with this person and that person. Doing that with 3,000 people is a whole other matter. And so that's why I think there's going to be kind of a, a phase of things that, that return. But, but to your point, we will have some face-to-face -face stuff again, especially things that you just can't replace. And, 
you know, maybe it starts with family because it's kind of like, well, I got to see my family over the holidays, but eventually it's going to spill over into our close personal, but eventually it's going to spill over into our close personal, our close business relationships, like you said, where, okay, you're starting a project. Yeah, you got to be in the same room for a day or two and get that going. So what if we take a local Acumatica user group, let's say, uh, I know the, the first Acumatica one was out in Denver, Colorado. So let's say I'm out in Denver, and I'm just curious your take from what you've heard with other software, enterprise software. You know, let's say we're going to get together for a, a user group. Just curious your thoughts, and, and maybe you don't really have specific thoughts, but you get together. How long do you get together? What do you do? Do you do it during work hours? Do you do it in the evening? Do you have any Best, best practices or, or common things that, that you hear going on? I mean, there's 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 really two functions of the user groups that are heavily funded by someone. So it, it really comes down to being a labor of love. And so you'll see local groups rise and fall based on the commitment of the organizers of the group at that particular point in time. Uh, I, I think all of the above can be productive, right? Like you could have uh, occasional day-long sessions where different companies present, that could be a wonderful format. Um, you know, you can mix that with networking. I mean, to me, if I'm running a local user group, I want to have, you know, a handful of more significant educational events and then and then probably more regular networking events. And, you know, the networking event can obviously be combined with a little bit of education. You know, you can have a short presentation by someone at each one of those, too. So there's a little bit of a blend there. The, the more interesting educational events are going to be a little more complicated to organize because you might have three to five different sessions, three to five different sessions or speakers, and so you're not going to do those that often. But it really depends on, on the momentum of the group and how many people, and like I said, the energy of the organizer. These things kind of ebb and flow. Um, but if I'm designing something, the, my biggest priority is trying to keep people engaged. And so it's probably better to have less elaborate events more often that, that are kind of chunked out and easy to connect, make it easy for people to do it, because the rhythm is so important to developing a sense of connection and relationship versus like just meeting once every six months or something for something bigger. I like that word rhythm. It seems like a lot of times it's easy to get stuck in the bigger, better trap where every event has to eclipse the one before it. Uh, I like it that. is. It is. And I think. I, I, I totally, it is. And I think. Rhythm. I, I, I totally agree with that. And I think that unfortunately software vendors aren't the best role models sometimes because I think sometimes they feel a huge obligation to, to create these hugely entertaining events and oh my god we got to secure these incredible guest keynotes and I tend to make cynical jokes about a lot of the celebrity keynotes as not being all that you know uh, I, I could probably pick a few of, to trash right now if I wanted to but the, the thing is like I just think a lot of times vendors don't realize that the the biggest piece of magic they they do is just putting people in the same situation, in the same room, and just stepping out of the way. I've seen it myself where, you know, get together like six customers around a table for dinner, get the conversation going, and just hear them just sharing tips and war stories. And I'll look around to, to whoever I'm sitting next to, and I'll be like, this is gold. Like, you know, you could, this is gold. Like, you know, you couldn't put a price on it. I mean, it's I mean, it's thousands of dollars in consulting, maybe just getting those tips, but it's it's deeper than that. And so, like to your point, it's not that hard to get people together. I mean, you can do it in a Zoom room, you know, and it doesn't require some elaborate agenda uh, in order to do it. However, it does require some facilitation skills, and I think that's the part. When, when people don't go down the path that I advocate around more interactive events, I think that's one of the blockers, is that I think that on a certain level they're afraid of the facilitation challenges because, look, facilitate, facilitating interactions can be difficult in certain groups and especially getting people started. But, but a lot of times once they're off and running, 
step out of the way. And so I think with user groups, it can work like that too. It's funny you mentioned uh, you get enough people in the room and you have the clicks just like in high school. <laughs> it seems like it's just yeah. human nature, right? And I agree that it's like the catalyst in chemistry. I haven't taken chemistry since high school, but you know I remember very clearly you can have two very powerful elements sitting next to each other, but without that catalyst to make them react, nothing happens. And right. I agree. That's what, What's the magic sauce that does that? Uh, is a good question, and you know, how do you do that regularly on that cadence? You know, that uh, that that rhythm that you mentioned. I think that is a real important skill to building community. Yeah, and I would just say that that you have to really the 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 design of events is very very dependent on the number of people, right? So, and and the amount of time allotted. So let's just let's just pretend like we're doing a Zoom event. We have five, ten, twenty, fifty, or a hundred people. Like those are radically different events, and and you have to have a different event design for each one. And and it can be done, but it's just very very important. And in general, though, like if you have a, a relatively smaller event. Your your emphasis has to be on making sure that that everyone speaks up. I mean, you need that structure. And what I find is that at events where you don't have that, like certain kind of alpha personalities end up dominating. And to your point, someone who might be more introverted and quieter, it can be kind of an alienating experience for them. And so that's where the facilitation part comes in. I, I would argue that you need some structure uh, before you move into more unstructured interactions a lot of times the kind of you know the the classic is just going around the room and making sure everyone just going around the room and making sure everyone addresses a certain point um, but again it, it you have to design that for different amounts of people it works differently but but that's sort of a key takeaway is that the wild west kind of format can can backfire what i'm hearing is that there's not really a a formula or algorithm. We're not dealing with computer software. We're dealing with people, and yep. that requires thought and energy to put it together. And so I'm curious on – I have two contrasting things, I think, but I think they're related. One is when you look at what you've seen with enterprise software communities, yeah, I think you have two approaches. One is independently owned versus publisher owned. And then the second yeah. – thing to contrast, and I think they're very related. One is a community as a hobby versus a community as a business. It takes to put in there, that translates pretty quickly into dollars. And so I'm curious, your take on you know, the likelihood of communities even thriving outside of a publisher because they can't become profit centers, whereas a publisher can look at them as a cost center, if that makes sense. Yeah. I don't think there's any right or wrong answers to those questions, uh, but but I think you've kind of summarized the trade-offs. I mean, the, the there can be something wonderful about grassroots communities that are not funded by the publisher or the vendor, but to your point, they could be harder to sustain and manage. There are certainly ways to do it because you can start creating membership fees and stuff, but now you're creating organizational structure, and that can be a challenge for the individuals involved. Um, Vendor-sponsored communities have, have that advantage of having more funding behind it, and so some of the hard work of administering events and stuff like that can be handled by the vendor. The danger is that the danger is that top-down community doesn't ultimately work, <laughs> uh, so so you get into trouble there. Um, there's no one right answer to to any of those those questions, and I've seen I've seen it work in all the ways you've described, and I've seen it fail in all the ways you've described. So I'm not sure that I can say one way is the best. But the one thing, and I got into this in sort of the same that same piece of the art of enterprise community a couple of years ago, was one of the key takeaways was. Um, don't muzzle your community leaders in supervision and brand talking points. Give them room to be bold and outspoken. So 
if you have a vendor or publisher community, however you describe that, and the community leaders aren't aren't able to be open in their concerns about your product or uh, situations, once you start, for example, censoring posts, now you've muzzled the community. Now the community is going to atrophy. Uh, now, which is not to say that there can't be community rules and norms, but but that's the the thing where vendors get sensitive around like, oh, you criticized our software, so we're deleting that post. Delete a few more posts like that, and suddenly you've taken the wind out of the sails of your entire community vision. So you have to figure out how to allow people to speak their minds and how to realize that that criticism is gold because you can take that to improve your product and come back and say, hey, what do you think now? Do we do better? You know? Um, so, so yeah, I think I think there's no one way, but you're right. There are very different dynamics between like community as a business versus grassroots. Yeah, I think we're very like-minded on that and that uh, I know you've used the phrase edgy content in the past and I, I yep. like that as well in the sense that I, I don't think you have community without chaos, community without chaos. If it's too controlled, exactly. I, I just don't see community really flourishing. And, you know, my tendency is to tend towards the side of chaos because I just feel like in this day and age, you can't keep a lid on things anyways. So rather than fight it, why not embrace it? And, you know, to your point, it's going to come back and positively benefit the software ultimately. If you're really a company that has the capacity to invest in developing the software, if you hear about a big pain point, you'll be able to address it, right? Uh, but, you know, there is that flip side of, especially from the investor standpoint, and especially if you're a publicly traded company, then things can get messy there. But from a pure community standpoint, I personally opt for chaos over control. Absolutely. And the one thing I would say is that there, there, especially online, there is such a thing as a troll, and you do have to have strategies for dealing with trolls. And, and, and you know, it's, it's a tricky thing because when you, when you deal with that, you could wind, you can wind up feeling, you know, people saying, oh, you censored this or that. I'll give you one quick example from, I, I, I moderate my local town community on Facebook. It's the hardest moderation job I've ever had. And the, the main reason I do it, in or, it, well, aside from like making a contribution, I guess, is because it's such a huge challenge. I learned so much. And I, I kick someone out of the group because they're basically trolling. Um, and, and you can tell trolls because they're kind of like looking, it's not so much what they're saying, but they're kind of looking, you can tell they're looking to disrupt and get attention and they're, the conversation is not getting anywhere. It's different than being critical. It, it, it's like you, you can tell they're going to just keep doing it. And, and, and one of the trolls' best friends on the group was like just throwing me under the bus after that because I kicked him out after that because I kicked him out of the group. And she's like, you don't let people speak your mind in here and, you know, you don't allow people to be themselves and blah, blah, blah. And, and I, what I responded to her, I just said, well, what are you still doing here then? <laughs> You know, it's like, why did I let you stay in the group then? You're still here. I'm, I haven't kicked you out. You're speaking your mind. And it, it's, and a it tough just, spot, though. it's almost lose-lose. Like, yeah, but you took some kind of action. I guess you, you had a spine. That was uh, – but the, but the good thing was it eventually diffused, it diffused the situation because she realized, hey, he's got a point. Like, I'm still here. And, and four years later, that, that outspoken woman is still in the group. And, you know, we're not best friends or anything, but she's still outspoken and says what she wants. But the thing is, she's not a troll. She's just very opinionated, and that's different. And um, so these are the things you kind of figure out. And I mentioned that just because we're so dependent on online community right now, and I think it's much harder to be a troll at an at a in-person event. <laughs> I suppose it can be done, but it's just difficult to do. But online, <laughs> it's just... Online is just so easy to be disruptive and to, and also just to be careless with what you're thinking. And so skillful moderation is definitely part of this, but it's a skill that you can learn. I'm curious, in, in that example, did you have multiple people that had had to vote on that, or did you have the full authority to kick someone out of the group? Full authority. And, and not every community works that way, but, uh, but, but this, this, the the whole thing with this is it's 
it's my it's my group and if you don't like the vibe in this group there's other local groups you can be a part of so it's like pick pick the one that you want this is how we run things here um, so there's a time and a place for a group like that but there's also a time and a place for for groups that are run more by committee uh, or where there is an appeals process for certain things as well um, it really depends on the nature of of the community I would think with customer communities there might be potentially some oversight or some appeal process for certain situations because you do want to avoid the potential for a, a, a community manager to behave unethically and to and for that to reflect back on you so I could see a need for more transparency in that situation in mine it's a little more straightforward which is there's a ton of groups like that so just you know each one is moderated differently so take your pick yeah I think you're hitting on another important point of community and I don't know what the right word for it is whether it's vibe or flavor or community guidelines or even the rules uh, I almost feel like it's almost somewhat organic like the way your body expels a foreign agent it's not necessarily according to a list of, of things that you check a bunch of boxes and yep okay you met all those criteria you're gone it's almost something organic that just kind of naturally doesn't fit the vibe or feel or whatever it is in the community so what do you think yeah every every community is going to develop its own set of norms and and they're they're not always going to be the same um, but but at, to your point there's always going to be some messy edge around a good community it's never going to be like you know some some sort of perfect culture but um, but yeah every every community is going to develop its own norms and, and the best communities really develop their own and and don't require a whole lot of top-down control I mean the one thing one thing that I really wanted to to mention that I didn't and I think it's one of the most important points in the podcast so I do want to get to it now which is that we've seen the rise of business user communities in recent years sort of beyond the developer communities and those are becoming I think more and more significant as we get into this era of customer success and uh, the area the customer we could have a long conversation about that but bottom line is that it's kind of like the subscription based software economy and the SaaS economy is taking hold and that means that uh, it's no longer about the big upfront sale and then you walk it's, it's all about building on that success within your customers and hopefully getting renewals and getting selling more stuff you're not going to do that if people don't believe in what you're doing and community is a really big part of that and a lot of these vendors have figured out how to engage more business users and so in the present tense because you were asking me about history present and future because you were asking me about history present and future we're seeing the rise of a lot of business user communities right now in a lot of a lot of different vendors and you know I think Acumatica has developed a pretty good business user community for example um, so we're seeing much more of a rise of that um, what I want to see in the future and what I think is going to be even more powerful is is what you might call the community mashup I, I want to see these barriers broken down so I want to see business users and developers and you know and designers and design thinkers or whoever you want to call them I want to see them all hanging out together I want to see vendors partners customers consultants I want to see them all part of the same community interacting in the same rooms and events because you can't those those distinctions are very arbitrary between these types of groups they all we're all we all have the same stake which is the groups they all we're all we all have the same stake which is to make these projects better and more successful and what we've learned again and again is that we need more iterative and agile approaches to to projects and we need to break down those barriers so we know about the different constituents that we're serving and that might even break down eventually into more externals of the customer of your customer the more all those people are in the same community the more power that community is going to have so in the future I'm looking towards more community mashups interesting point I've never considered that to me it's like it's hard enough to get people together with a common interest <laughs> to go across developers it is. and business users that that's uh, I like that 
That, well, let me and let me give you just one example of that. I've been to I've been to some hackathons like that that were very interesting, where 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 there was a design of a business case that involved much more functional and 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 designer than off the code. So everyone was interacting together at that point, the same whiteboard. Um, now the hackathon format has its limitations there because once the developers start to code you're kind of waiting on them to code. <laughs> so so there are some limitations of that format in some ways, but but it was fascinating to be able to watch such a diverse group of constituents, but they're all talking about like what does the software need to what does the end result need to look like? And for developers to then go into their hackathon code with with those conversations at heart, they've already had those conversations with business users and project managers and everyone involved, really cool. And and that to me was like powerful. Now, are those people going to go have dinner with each other afterwards? Maybe not. I mean, the thing the thing with these mashups is that they might. You're still going to ultimately glom on to people who are similar to you for the most part, aside from some kind of remarkable odd couple type friendships. But 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 kind of friendships. But 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 kind of those mix-ins can be really neat, and and they can kind of really stimulate the the rest of it. I like that. Yeah, hackathons really lend themselves to that because you're still at least focused on a project. You're not right. just hanging out at the bar. Uh, so you can get different people together focused on a common thing. But then it's still fun because you're, you know, hopefully the setting is kind of a fun setting and maybe there's a there's food involved or something to keep you fueled. Exactly. I, I did a couple of uh, hackathons last couple of years and a similar kind of a vibe. I think one thing I struggle with, curious if you have, uh, a take on this is just the time limit and it was a similar experience that you knew you had about 24 hours so you had to get coding pretty quickly and then once so you're up front certain people are involved and then you're sitting around when then the coders are involved curious if you've curious if you've seen anyone do anything unique to accommodate that challenge I have it I have some ideas about it I mean it's never going to be totally perfect because some of the coders are going to stay up all night in some cases, and no one else probably wants to do that. Um, but I think what I might do is design, if I were doing this, is design a format where when the developers go to code, the rest of the people, which could include, like, let's say you're doing something for, like, nonprofits, um, you know, solutions uh, for for, like, coronavirus monitoring or whatever, like, so you have people like building apps or whatever related to whatever ge geography monitoring, whatever it is. So, the developers go off to work. Well, what else could the functional people be working on while they're waiting on the developers? The things that come to mind are things like what would be the business plan? What would be the project plan? What would be the project plan? So, it might be interesting to set up a hackathon where you then kind of try to unite those elements at the end. And so you're not just presenting the finished app that you've come up with, but you're presenting your go-to-market plan that's been built alongside the 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 app. Now, you know, obviously the, the you know, it's a little limited because the developers are separate at that point cuz they're trying to concentrate, so they're not part of the other discussion, but that might be a way of keeping the other people busy while the developers are coding. That's a good point. Just off Actually, the top of my head. Yeah, if I think about Acumatica hackathons the last few years, they've kind of evolved that way that there more and more attention is given to the presentation and also to the storyline that you're presenting right. the solution in the context of and even having some props, things like that. Like someone did something turning on a lamp with uh, like an if this, then that type of a solution. But a lot of it just has to, but a lot of it just has to do with describing the pain point and the story behind it and why the solution matters in the real world. I think that's a good point. You don't have to just sit around and wait to see if the code actually works. You can still tell a story even if your code isn't fully functional. Yeah, and I think eventually you could figure out how to how to really tie that into productized stuff where it's like, you know, hey, you know, like we'll present this to a board of Acumatica folks and at least one of these will be productized or you have to figure out how to do it in a way that's, you know, that protects everyone and doesn't like it, you know, overcommit people, but like, I just, because to me, like, you know, it's like, 
it's not just showing off the app. Like, like what if you kind of made the pitch of like, here's why we should turn this into a real thing. Like, here's the business case for turning this into a real bona fide app that customers could download in the future. And, you know, just, just kind of interesting to think about how, how you would pitch that as part of your final presentation, developer for coding or something. So I think there's ways of doing it. But I love your point about crossing groups between what traditionally has been more developer-focused communities versus, to your point, maybe not even so much end-user communities, but more and more so now, although it's still a little bit of oil and water, crossing those two groups together more. I think that's a great yeah. vision or something to strive for towards the future. Well, and think also, just real quick on that, think about the value of mixing partners and developers together because a lot of partners, including Acumatica partners, would love to know more about how to churn their IP in their industry that they can, you know, implement Acumatica in into actual like apps and software and ramp ups and, you know, readiness assessments or whatever it is they want to build into software. How about meeting some developers and learning how that's done? Maybe they can even contract some of those people, ask some of those people after the show. So there's all kinds of reasons why you want to mash all these groups together. And it would take some creativity, obviously, because like you said, they're not people that naturally that necessarily see an immediate culture fit between themselves, but that's that's the creative facilitation challenge and I think when you're when you get really good at community you figure out how to how to do it. That's a great point. I, I'd love to see that happen more in the future. That that was was something I've noticed last couple of hackathons. You start to see these cool solutions start to come out. And then what happens practically is they go on GitHub as an open source, unsupported right. dump of code, right? And it's it's so close to being many times something that's really usable. And I'd love to see more and more of those connection points happen now to the business side to be able to actually take it, monetize it, continue developers to, to make it production ready and turn it into something that that can be monetized. I'd love to see that that last step. I feel like it's so close to happening. Right. I'd love to see that happen more out of a hackathon. Absolutely. Well, hey, John, I, I really appreciate your time. I know you, uh, you're you not feeling so great right now, but I appreciate you still jumping on a call and giving your thoughts on community. Hey, man, I was probably just going to watch some Netflix tonight anyway, so this works out great. I <laughs> had a really good conversation. So it's all, it's all nice. So really appreciate your interest in this topic and uh, look forward to tracking your podcast series. Awesome. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks, Tim. All right. Well, that's it for now. Thanks for yeah. listening. And we'll catch you on the next AUG blog audio post.